Hey everyone, thanks for joining us today uh, for our February live stream where we have some great guests that I'll be introducing to you guys all here in just a minute. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, here's what you can expect. We will introduce our friends from the Project here and we will talk a little bit about this month's giveaway and then we'll let them talk a little bit about projects and also our, our friends from Audio Engine. We'll go over the Audio Engine lineup as well. Uh, and then we'll open it up to audience questions. So if you have a question, feel free to post that in the comments. We can see those coming in through both uh, Facebook and through YouTube. So we feel, feel, feel free to ask us a, a great question, anything you wanna know about turntables, about powered speakers, uh, anything is, is fair game. Uh, let us know where you are joining us from. It's always fun to see where everybody's joining us from. I'm here in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, which is uh, a very nice day today. We're actually getting a little bit more sunlight, which is great. So let us know where you guys are joining us from. And uh, we will introduce our group here in just a minute. And at the end, we will obviously announce our winner for best question. So again, if you have a great question, let us know. And then we'll announce our winner from our month long giveaway. So again, welcome. Hopefully you guys will learn something today. Hopefully we'll have a lot of fun as well. So uh, joining me from Audio Advice, uh, if you guys remember Leon Shaw, who's normally with us as my co-host, he is on the road this week. So I'm welcoming Nick Rich. So Nick, welcome. Glad to have you today. The second best option. <laughs> Leon's hard to follow, so I think we all fall into that category. So Nick is on my uh, my sales team. He's one of our top leaders and is incredibly knowledgeable, very much an audiophile at heart. So uh, Nick, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're joining us from. And of course, it is a happy hour. So cheers, gentlemen. Uh, it's uh, five o'clock here on the East Coast. So let us know what it is that you're drinking as well. Yeah, so I'm joining in from uh, the lovely small town of Lyman, South Carolina. That's uh, outside of uh, Greenville. And uh no, I'm definitely glad to be here. And today I'm sipping on a uh, Prairie Bomb. Well, it's actually their Noir series. And they're a really great brewery out of Oklahoma. Cool. Uh, we always ask our guests, what is the first concert that you remember going to? So I'm going to ask you that question. And then just for fun, uh, hopefully there's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. So once we are allowed to be back on the road and see live shows again, what is the first concert that you want to see once we're able to do so? So favorite concert, first concert. Yeah. So, well... I, first concert was uh, kind of three people in one. So I was no, no, young. And, we don't want to know about Backstreet Boys. So what was your oh, first? Well, one? Actually, actually, I'm going to surprise you. So I was like a huge 80s fan in like middle school. And so I begged my mom to go see Journey. Uh, and she was really not a huge Journey fan. So uh, it was a concert between Journey, Heart, and Cheap Trick. Wow. And I was in heaven. And so that was uh, obviously I'm young. I look like I'm probably 14 on here. But uh, <laughs> so that was uh, that was my favorite concert at the, at the time. Still one of my top ones. Uh, after all this is over, you know, it's going to be weird going to concerts anyway. But I would say probably either Sturgill Simpson uh, or probably Orville Peck is another really good one. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Nick is a young face, but an old soul, right? <laughs> so, like <laughs> glad to have you. Nick is incredibly knowledgeable about all things, uh, turntables, powered speakers, home theater, you name it. Yeah. He's, he's got a ton of knowledge as well. So joining us from uh, our friends at project is, uh, Jeff Coates. Jeff, welcome. Thanks for joining us this evening. And I guess for you, it's a little bit earlier in the day. So yeah, a little uh, bit earlier. Tell us where you're us from and, uh, what it is that you're drinking this afternoon. Well, I'm down in here in Austin, Texas. Uh, it's a beautiful 75 degree day right. here in Austin. So all you folks on the right hand side that are clicking through, sharing your stories about snow and misery, I'm sorry for you. I right? try not to rub it in, y'all. It's it's tough. But uh, yeah, and as far as drinking, I got a this is a beer out of Houston, Carbach, their light circus, really nice hazy IPA. You know, it's New England style, but you know, we still they make some pretty good ones down here in down here in Texas. Cool. Same so, question. Uh, first concert you remember going to, and then what is the first concert that you can't wait to see? Well, first one I actually bought a ticket for, and this is going to date me. Um, I don't look 14 on camera, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> it was Skid Row and Bon Jovi in a parking lot in Manchester, New Hampshire. Oh, there you um, go. Talk about 80s hair metal. Uh, that was that was pretty fantastic, actually. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I, Nick, it's like you're secretly my musical brother from another. I was listening to the Unrighteous Brothers last night, Paul mm -hmm. Cawthon and Orville awesome. Peck. And, uh, so, yeah, big fan of Americana stuff. But the, the one I'm most looking forward to is the now three times rescheduled Black Pumas uh, show at Stubbs down here in Austin. Uh, that was originally scheduled for this summer. Obviously didn't happen, got kicked to the fall, and now we're trying to do it again in, uh, in May. So we'll see. Hopefully. Hopefully make it happen. 
Yeah. Uh, and also from Project and Seneca is uh, Buzz. Welcome. Thanks for joining us this evening. You uh, you are one of those lucky folks who's up in the Northeast. So let everybody know where you're joining us from and what it is that you're drinking this evening. I am. I am uh, in lovely South Dartmouth, Massachusetts, right near Buzzards Bay. And appropriately, <laughs> I'm actually drinking a Buzzards Bay sour. This is brewed by the women who work at the brewery. Women are smart. Women are good. Women brew beer. Brew beer as women should, and it's delicious. Uh, so cheers to all them. All right. um, I can answer both those questions. I can't really remember actually what the first concert I went to. The first concert I remember, and I know it wasn't the first one, was actually older than anybody here, Led Zeppelin at, uh, in Syracuse. We drove five hours to see them, and it was, uh, well, you can imagine, it was Led Zeppelin Live. So that was uh, that was something else. And what I'm Dying to Go See is one of my favorite bands that always comes and plays in this little weird old mill building in Fall River, Massachusetts, the Narrow Center for the Arts. That would be Los Lobos, who's like, I've seen them probably more times than any, and it's always, I've got, I've like, my face hurts from smiling so much at the end of the show. Great stuff. Awesome. Cool. Well, welcome. Um, we already got a, a good question from, from Wayne. Jeff, from, uh, yeah. he's asking, Jeff, we'll come back to it, because I know we'll talk, a lot of folks will ask you know, best demo track and so forth. But he says, you got a lot of vinyl, a lot of great vinyl in the background. He would love to hear a little bit more about what's your favorite, maybe some go-to tracks that we'll get to. So sure. uh, again, welcome gentlemen. You know, if you've got a great concert that you can't wait to go see, let us know. I'll be honest with you, for, for me, my kids have been watching a lot of uh, Ed Sheeran on YouTube. Uh, so they're, they're, they're pumped to hopefully one day be able to go see him. So that's what I'm looking forward to taking my kids to go see uh, once we're all able to get back out there. So uh, thanks again for joining us. Let me uh, really quickly introduce our giveaway really quick. And, and Jeff, I'll hand it back over to you so that you can tell us a little bit more about it. And I know you've got uh, an actual example behind you, but I'll put up one of the nice photos here. Uh, sure. Actually, let me go to this one. So we are giving away a little over $1,100 value, the Project Debut Record Master Audio Engine A5 Plus uh, wireless speakers. And of course, our audio advice record care bundle. So we are really excited about that. Oh, again, over $1,100 value. Um, Give me one second here. So, uh, Jeff, tell us a little bit about the the um, debut record master. Yeah, sure. And first off, a little shout out to T May on the side here. Absolutely know where Methuen is. I uh, lived in the uh, record for a little while and grew up in southern New Hampshire. So, you know, got to give a shout out to the Massachusetts boys over here. But um, yeah, so debut record master. It's a it's a pretty smoking turntable. Um, you know, one of the things that that we've seen a huge growth in in the last couple of years is people that are just getting started and playing records, or maybe they're coming back to it from years away. Um, and chances are their stereo looks a lot different in 2020 than it did back in 1978 or heck, even 1995. Um, so a big part of that is having a built-in phono preamp. Uh, one of the big things that we've seen a huge growth in is people that want to play not through a traditional stereo system necessarily, but through a powered speaker system like the audio engines we're giving away today. Um, or a Sonos uh, or Heos or Blue Sound distributed audio system, uh, or maybe a home theater receiver that doesn't have a built-in phono preamplifier anymore. Um, so one of the cool things with the debut record master takes a lot of things that we really love from our real high quality debut line of tables, but it gives some really neat features. First of which is a built-in phono preamp, so you can connect it to whatever you want to listen to your records through. Um, and then the other big one is electronic speed change. Um, I kind of mentioned a, a, a little 45 RPM, you know, seven inch single. It's a big pain in the neck if you're trying to play 45s and you have to manually remove the platter, move the belt to go from 33 and a third to 45. Um, so the debut record master handles that with a nice little electronic selection uh, right on the top of the deck. Really great sound on a little table. Awesome, awesome. And that's a $500 value with a turntable, correct? That's right. Awesome. Actually, five fifty in the uh, five fifty in the satin walnut finish, which is what we're giving away today. Yeah, there you, so go. There you go. Really walnut. beautiful, real walnut veneer. Yeah, walnut looks great. Um, Nick, tell us a little bit about Audio Engine and specifically the Audio Engine A five plus wireless. Yeah, Audio Engine's been probably one of our most popular powered speakers for years. Now, uh, they, they set themselves apart by doing something that. Not many other companies do. They put class AB amps in a lot of their powered speakers. Uh, you know, I guess from the A2 plus up is all class AB amplification, whenever most are class D. So if uh, 
you guys know about amps. It's a good thing. Uh, you know, a couple other things they use that are you know, kind of similar to higher end speakers. They use Kevlar tweeters and silk, or excuse me, uh, Kevlar uh, woofers and then silk dome tweeters, uh, which are you know, popular even with companies like Bowers and Wilkins, uh, things like that. Uh, they also have Bluetooth, specifically the A5 Plus wireless. They have the Aptex Bluetooth, which is a type of codex that's for uh, high res Bluetooth transfer. Now you do have to have it on your cell phone, but once you have that feature, it sounds fantastic. So you know, good, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, good American company, fantastic product, uh, good build quality, and it pairs great with the project tables. Yeah, and actually uh, Brady, one of the founders of Audio Engine is, is in your neck of the woods, Jeff, out there uh, in Texas. I think he actually is from Austin as well. So those guys are good friends of ours. Um, shout out to those guys. They couldn't have someone make it here tonight, but we know those guys really, really well. They've been partners of ours for several years and they, like Nick said, they build a great powered speaker. I've had the A5 plus wireless, uh, myself for many, many years. Um, they have, they start with a little, you know, if you're interested in a small pair of bookshelf speakers, the A1 that they just came out with can't beat for the, uh, for the price. And then you can step up to the A2 plus, uh, wireless. And then like Nick mentioned, they have the the A5 Classics, which doesn't have the Bluetooth built in, and then they have the step up for the A5 Plus, A5 Plus Wireless, which is what we're giving away today. Um, and they also have uh, the H-Series, HD3, yep. HD4, uh, HD6, if you want something with a little bit more muscle and, and, uh, and power. And they've also got a great, set, a great uh, set of passive speakers as well, as well as the Audio Engine B1, which is really cool, Bluetooth streamer. So we'll put links to those as well. We've got lots of content for uh, Audio Engine where we compare all of those different speakers that I just mentioned. So we'll make sure that we link to those uh, throughout as well. So if you're looking for a great pair of powered speakers, you obviously can't go wrong with Audio Engine. So um, thanks for giving us that, that overview. Uh, let's see, I had a great question that I wanted to put up from, I'll pull it up here real quick. Give me one second. This is sorry, guys. Lot, lots of screens. I'm trying to balance here. From Michael sure. B, who's asking a great question. If we can put that up, there we go. For someone that's just getting started out on their turntable adventure, what are the key features, specs, considerations one should keep in mind building their first set? So I'll maybe throw it out to you, uh, Jeff, and then we'll go around All the right. horn and take a shot at that. Yeah. Well, first off, uh, welcome to the tent, Michael. It's like, or is it, or Michelle? It's uh. Apologize if I'm pronouncing it wrong, but um, yeah, I mean, it's it, it, the first thing I'd say is probably don't overthink it. You know, think about the way that you want to use the system. Make sure it's going to fit into the way that your life works. Um, you know, if you've got if you've got pets, if you've got kids, if you've got sort of considerations, um, I find it's really important to get a system that's good and usable and fits into your life. Otherwise, it just becomes one of those things that you're like, yeah, I remember back in pandemic, I tried to like get into records and well, it didn't really work out. Um, that's one of the things that we've been enjoying a lot of the last couple of years. But as far as, you know, basic functionality, I think just, especially early on, minimize your box count. You know, as you get, you know, more into it and you get crazy over the years, you know, you're going to find that your system probably grows out into separates and you're going to have things that, you know, that everything's got a specific task and it does a specific job. Um, but usually starting off with something simple, um, but really high quality um, is really important. I got a little story here because I always thought I wanted to be a bass player and I'm a little jealous. I see my friends here with their guitars in the back. And so I went to a music store and I bought the, you know, a, a good looking P bass knockoff, but it had a terrible, terrible action uh, to the point where, you know, I, my fingers weren't strong enough to even, you know, press the, uh, to press the string downs properly on the fret it buzzed. It sounded terrible. Um, so I never learned how to play bass. Um, a, very, very similar when you're playing records. Um, if you start off, you know, you're buying brand new records, maybe reissues, stuff that's, you know, 20, 30, 40 bucks to throw in some cases. And you then play that on a really inexpensive turntable with a plastic tone arm and a cheap cartridge, you're going to get really unsatisfactory sound. And we see that with a lot of these sort of all in one speaker built in, look like a little suitcase type systems. Um, and it's a great way to get turned off from the whole experience. So, you know, you don't have to go nuts. I mean, a system like we're talking about today around a thousand bucks is a great right. way to start getting into really high quality music playback um, and also allowing you to do things that are important like streaming. Because, you know, I got a ton of records here, but I'd be lying to tell you if I don't, I've spent a lot of time listening to streaming audio too. So it's real important that whatever system you decide on, um, it can incorporate both the way that you typically listen to music and then sort of your aspirational music source, which might be a turntable or what have you. 
Great. Yeah. Any other any other thoughts, uh, Buzz or Nick? Um, I would just in in the turntable specifically. Um, first thing, avoid plastic. Um, you know, the the cheaper turntables are plastic and they're essentially hollow. A turntable. All the music is coming from a needle vibrating in a groove. So vibrations are the whole key. That's where the music's coming from. Any other vibrations that you hear are by definition distortion. And if you've got a hollow plastic box, which is what most of the inexpensive turntables have, they tend to vibrate and resonate, particularly when you start turning up the music when it starts to sound good and it will sound worse. Um, and you know, typically, if you add on a whole bunch of features, auto return, auto start, all those things, you're adding all these mechanical things, which actually impinge on the sound. They also reduce reliability in the long run. You know, we don't really need that convenience anymore. If you want the music to just keep playing, then go streaming. If you want to do some deliberate listening, which is really what one of the great things about vinyl is, where you really immerse yourself in it, then get yourself a good manual turntable. Most of the specs and things you'll you'll see, you can look at, actually just look at the debut record master and there's a great baseline of specifications for you. You may or may not want the built-in phono preamp. It even has a USB output to archive your records. Um, so, if those things aren't as important, you can get a little less expensive one. But don't go too cheap in the beginning because it'll chew up your records and and they're they're fairly expensive. And they're also something, you know, Jeff's record collection is like his grandkids are gonna inherit that stuff and it's gonna be worth the fortune. Uh, That's right. the money, I bet. <laughs> yeah, I, I've got a I got a little thing to add. So I think your first system should be upgradable. That's the biggest piece is, you know, and Project does a really good job of this, you know, with different accessories, like the debut carbon, for example, has a huge upgrade path. And so keeping your system, you know, somewhat, even though you want to minimize boxes, you want to keep it somewhat modular so you can upgrade a piece at a time. So it doesn't take another initial investment of, you know, a thousand dollars, you know, you can upgrade just the phono preamp, you can upgrade the speakers, the amplifier, each piece, and it can really pay off. And you know, make sure you put a good um, a cartridge or stylus on right off the gate. And Project comes with them, uh, but you know, if you get a cheaper table and they have, you know, pretty cheap uh, cartridge or stylus on there, go ahead and upgrade it. It's going to just change the entire uh, Chire's sound, and it's going to benefit all your records. So, Nick, for those who maybe are new to audio or especially new to vinyl, uh, and and you say that it's upgradable, so maybe can you unpack one, two, three different components of the turntable that you would go to first? Uh, yeah with regards to where you can upgrade? So a few things on like the project tables, you can swap out uh, the power supply, which is a big one. Uh, you can uh, change to electronic power supply or electronic speed change, excuse me. Uh, and then upgrade your phono cables. You can add uh, different weights to the records themselves, so record pucks, record weights. Uh, there's, there's quite a few pieces and just the cartridge itself. So not all turntables allow you to swap out the cartridge. Having the adjustable counterweight uh, is a big piece, and some of the cheaper tables don't have that, as well as anti-skate. Uh, so anti-skate adjustment will allow you to go through and upgrade the cartridge to something a little bit nicer, and it's not going to mess up the sound of the uh, the table at all. Yeah, absolutely. And that, Nick, that's a great point, because I've seen a couple of tables from real reputable manufacturers that look like they should be yeah. a good upgradable product, and then you take a look at the tone arm, and it's like, wait a minute, the, the, the counterweight doesn't move. So you're you're stuck, you can never replace the cartridge. You've got whatever cartridge it came with. Well, and you know, Project, you guys uh, include Ortofon and Samico cartridges. One cool thing about those, you don't have to, because some people are afraid to just swap out the whole cartridge because you know it's got lead wires on, it can look a little bit scary, have to do extra adjustments, but with both Ortofon and Samico cartridges, you can just slide out the stylus and put a new one on and it's, it's a total upgrade, it's a game changer. Mm -hmm. It's kind of amazing. I mean, it really, because the, the you, to Buzz's point, you know, the job of the phono cards is just pick up those little minute yep. deflections in the groove wall, right? So it's picking up those little vibrations. The better the job, a more sensitive stylus, a different stylus profile that can dig a little deeper in the groove, it's going to mm -hmm. extract a lot more information. The cool part, as you point out, Nick, is it uses the same generator. So the yep. part that's hanging off the, the end of the tone arm that the wires are connected to, that's the same. All you're doing is just swapping out the little stylus part. Um, so yeah, in the case of the Davy Carbon Evo, we've, we've got you know, three different stylus options that fit into that. Um, the case of this, uh, the Davy Record Master, Ortofon, this ships with an OM5E. Um, they make all the way up to an OM30. Yep. So they make four different stops that you can go and do a real simple like five minute upgrade and it's like you got a brand new system. Yep. Yeah. We got lots of content on how to, to uh, you know, 
uh, put, a, put a new stylus in and balance your turntable, all those good things. So that's a great point. And here's my, my quick shameless, shameless plug for audio advice. Obviously, um, if you want to talk to someone like Nick who can help you help walk you through that, that journey of purchasing your first turntable or maybe your first turntable and powered speakers package, now, uh, Nick, we have a whole team that are available on phone, on chat, and you can see someone as, as knowledgeable as Nick is there available for you to again to kind of walk you through through that journey. And we're happy to, to help you guys out. I wanted to come back to a question from Ray. Uh, I'll just say Ray V. Apologize, Ray. I don't want to uh, mispronounce your last name. But again, you know, any question is fair game. Please don't feel like there's a question that you uh, would feel uh, not or disqualified asking because we want to, you know, educate as many people as we possibly can. So I want to ask this question and then I want to ask it in the context of a turntable and speaker uh, package or combination, right? So they said, would love a new pair of speakers, but I don't know how much technical stuff. So uh, I hope I'm not disqualified. So we'll talk a little bit about, you know, powered speakers, but maybe I'll come to you first is, you know, when you're, when you're setting up a turntable and a pair of speakers, it doesn't necessarily automatically just, you know, plug in and, and ready to play. One of the great things about the debut record master is it has the phono stage built in. So maybe Jeff, I'll walk you, allow you to kind of walk us through. If you have a turntable and you have some speakers, what are a couple of different options to make those work? And the great thing about this giveaway is it is more or less just plug and play, but you obviously can, can do uh, approach that either with a phono stage, how that works through the powered speaker or through the turntable or something external. So I know it's a lot to throw at you, but wow. You yeah. Usually I have like, you know, some visual aids, wait, visual aids. I have that. Um, so when you, um, when you go in the, a lot of we get this a lot where people buy a pair of speakers or they're gifted a pair of speakers and they go cool well great what do i need to make them play music um so in the case of like the audio engine we've got a really nice class ab power amp built in in that case all you need is a source so whatever you're going to play music could be a phone could be a turntable uh could be a cd player whatever kind of device you want to connect to it your computer um if depending on the turntable that you had you know the signal that's coming from that tiny little phono cartridge and it's kind of amazing when you think about it there's a tiny little electrical signal that's coming out the back of those leads from your your turntable now that's about what a thousand times lower in amplitude than what's coming out of the output of like a cd player and it's equalized a little differently because if they tried to squeeze the same amount of bass information as treble information into the grooves of a record the groove walls would be like a foot wide and you'd never be able to get a stylus that could trace them so they do two things when they actually pay, take that music and they put it onto the, the surface of a, uh, of a LP. First, at very, very low in level. Um, and the second is it's going to be, they just call what's inverse RIAA equalization. That'll be on the test, everybody, uh, <laughs> where they basically pull down the deepest bass and boost the high frequencies. So when we play that back through an audio system, we need a device that can first off boost the signal. So it'll play as loudly as a traditional source, like a CD player or what have you. And then it also re-equalizes that signal so that the bass and the treble are pop properly balanced. Um, so you can do that a couple ways. Um, this is a, a really nice outboard phono preamp. This is something called our PhotoBox Ultra 500. Um, and this very, very simple. It has a set of inputs from the turntable and then a set of outputs that could connect into any input on a stereo system that was labeled tape or auxiliary or CD what we call a line level source. So this device gives us all that gain we need and the equalization. So that feature is built into the debut record master. Um, and I saw somebody kind of back in, in the thread here, um, and as far as upgradability and that sort of thing, out of the gates, the debut record master in its current form, um, it does have a built-in photo preamp, but let's say you do get an amplifier that has a built-in photo stage. It's maybe a little bit better or more sophisticated. We have the equivalent of about $150 phono stage built into that product. Um, let's say you have an amplifier that's got something a little better. You want yeah, to buy really that. quick, if I don't mind, what, what is a phono sure. stage and uh, and what does it do? And a lot sure. of people are asking how does how does a turntable digitize music? So I think you probably know where I'm going. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. So uh, yeah, a couple of good questions. So uh, the phono stage, and that's you know to use that visual aid, that's this box, and this box could is built into the debut record master essentially. And it has two jobs. The first is to boost the out electrical output that's coming off the phono cartridge. So that's the portion that actually reads the information that's encoded in the groove walls. So it gives that boost and then it equalizes it to make sure that the, the highs, the middle frequencies and the lows are all equally balanced. So that's the job of a phono stage. If you 
plugged a turntable that didn't have a phono stage right into the input on say that audio engine speaker, um, if you heard anything, what you'd hear would be very, very quiet and it would be almost all high frequencies. Yeah. It's the job of the, the phono stage is to provide the boost and then to do that equalization. And we, we get that quite a bit from folks, believe it or not, every now and then they'll hook their turntable up and plug it into their speaker and they'll say, I can barely, barely hear anything. What am I doing wrong? And the answer is you're not doing anything wrong. You just need a phono stage. So a lot of times uh, when we recommend something like this, especially for kind of a, an introductory package, uh, we, we recommend either the either the speaker has a phono stage built in, or in this case, the turntable has a t the phono stage built in. And usually it's just as simple as, you know, flipping a switch to make sure that it's on that phono setting, right? And that, that'll get you going right away. So the great thing is the debut record master already has the phono stage uh, built in. You can just plug it right into the audio engine A5 plus wireless, make sure it's set on phono for your source and you're, you're off and running, right? And that, that makes it really, really simple. You can well, say you had like a set of those passive audio engine speakers that you mentioned. They don't have an amplifier built in. You know, in that case, you'd need something to take the signal coming out of that source or out of that out of that phono stage, and then amplify that so that it could be used by a speaker. And that you know, people call them all kinds of crazy things. They're like, hey, you got a tuna? It's like it could be right. you know, your old tuner. It could be a stereo receiver. It's an amplifier, but it's some sort of a device that has low level inputs and then a speaker level connection on the output side. So if you're sitting there looking at the back of a speaker going, I see this red and black plug that it looks like I put wires in and I don't have that on the back of my turntable, that's what you need is those two pieces in between, the phono stage and then some sort of an amplifier or receiver. Got it, so hopefully we made that clear for you guys. If not, keep asking away. And Nick, maybe you have something to add, but keep yeah. asking questions. We'll make sure we keep trying to clarify that. And one thing I wanna mention real quick, real quick before I hand it back over to you, Nick is, um, if you have, we're going to get through as many questions as we can in the next 30 minutes or so. We will also make sure that we come back and uh, our team from Audio Advice, I think Buzz is going to also answer some questions on behalf of Project uh, as well. So we'll make sure that we answer as many of these questions as we can uh, so that when you go back and rewatch this, you'll see those questions answered. And again, we'll knock out as many of those as we can. So we'll get through as many as we can and we'll, we'll answer some of those more in-depth questions if you have them or link to some of the content that we have available. Uh, again, to try to answer maybe some of those questions that are just a little bit more technical for everyone. So Nick, yeah. So, you know, they were they were asking about, you know, being kind of afraid of the technicalities behind audio. And really, a lot of these systems are as simple as you want to make them or they're as complex as you want to make them. You know, there you can go down to breaking down each piece of the speaker or you can just look at it as a whole system. So, you know, if uh, you know, another plug to us, but this seriously, if uh, you know, if you're looking to get into it and you want to try it, just feel free to give us a call. We walk through with people, you know, setups uh, for holiday gifts and we explain it and you know they're they're showing their spouse how to put it together by the time christmas comes around because it's really simple it can just be somewhat intimidating so if you guys ever have any questions we have a lot of blogs on there we also have the uh chat function on our site chat in um or just call in either one works awesome yeah uh we'll start uh firing away at a couple more questions here i guess nick maybe you could just add if someone's got a great turntable with a phono stage you know what are some of the great selling points of the audio engine A5 plus wireless. If you want to use vinyl, or obviously you have options to use, you know, any a number of other sources as well. Yeah, I mean, there's pretty much there's two types of well, there's a there's a lot of types of inputs, but uh, you know, for for simplicity's sake, let's say analog and digital, you know, because there are analog, which is turntables, uh, or well, pretty much. CD players, anything that's an analog, RCA, just a red and a white. You know, that's that's an analog. Uh, and then there's digital, which are your USBs, your uh, opticals, digital coax, et cetera. But these pretty much do it all. So they have digital inputs, they have Bluetooth, and they have analog. So pretty much anything you can think to connect, it's going to connect to. Uh, your phone, your computer, your laptop, a uh, reel-to-reel -reel player, a tape cassette, whatever you want. As long as you have you know one or two things connected at, uh, at a time, it works really well. And you can switch in between inputs. So it's, it's super neat. You can do it with... Uh, actually, their whole line has... Yeah, I think with the exception of the A, no, I think almost their entire line has both inputs, which is which is really cool. So, you know, if you're looking for a simple setup, that's the way to do it. Apartments, you know, where you don't want components sitting around, powered speakers are the way to do it. Um, another side note, I meant to mention earlier, uh, right now a lot of people have desks that they're working at. I work at a desk from home, so uh, the HD threes are really really good desk speakers for your computer. You can just set them up; they're a small footprint and uh, yeah, it's perfect. 
Yeah, I use, um, I have a pair, especially if you're, like you said, we're all working from home and I use a pair of, uh, I go back and forth between a pair of Audio Engine A5 Plus Wireless and a pair of Clips 5s, which you guys know we've been a big fan of as well, uh, for the external audio from my computer, right? And it's great because I can listen to music, but it also works really well for uh, conference calls, Zoom meetings and so forth. And I think Nick, several folks have been asking about your external mic. Uh, oh. I've got, also I've got a Blue Snowball that's really, really simple just to plug and play, plug it right into my USB. I know uh, you've got something similar yeah, this was uh, this is the uh, Blue Yeti. It started out for me wanting to make music, but instead I uh, I work with it for most of the time. So I've got this. Um, I actually I don't have computer speakers because I have a system behind me. Yeah. Uh, so I use that, and uh, well, I can't get them down right now. But a pair of uh, just a pair of headphones. So that's all I work with. Love it. Uh, but yeah, it's great. Super simple setup. And one of the great things about the Audio Engine A5 Plus Wireless, again, you can, if you're building out your uh, your vinyl collection and you've only got a couple different options for you, you know, you can just plug it in, or I'm sorry, you can just connect via Bluetooth from your phone. Uh, and it's super easy just with a push of the button. You can also do it via the uh, remote control, I believe, as well. And so it's a great way to be able to stream music and so forth. Um, Jeff, you got a lot of fanboys. I'm sorry, Buzz, go ahead. Well, I was just going to chime in. I saw a bunch of questions that I've been reading while you guys have been chatting, and I saw a, a bunch of them that I can answer pretty quickly. One is a lot of people are wondering about how they isolate their turntable. They have loose floors. I live in an old New England house, and I'm I'm well aware of that. Um, and and that since we were talking about vibration and the small needle in the groove, that isolation is super important. So you can get what are called isolation bases that add mass and help to divert the uh, and absorb the vibrations away. Or what I my solution was, even though I have a big heavy turntable, is I got a wall mount bracket for it. Um, Project even makes a turntable you can mount directly onto the wall that's actually vertical. That's more to, so that it doesn't take up space. But there are lots of options for that. We also make absorption materials that you can use for that. Um, these go along with a bunch of questions that ask, people have asked about what accessories you can have for it. So the isolation bases are really super important. Cleaning your vinyl is super important. And then I saw people asking about platters too. So we make a wide variety of mats. We have felt mats, cork mats, we have cork and rubber mats, leather mats, and we even have acrylic platters too. All of these have their benefits and there's varying levels of cost with them as well. Um, and so these are the kinds of things that it's great. I mean, we're happy to answer the questions here, but I'm gonna make a, a shameless plug here actually for audio advice, because when people are asking questions and not feeling comfortable about it, audio advice, I've been in the business my entire life and audio advice is the place I would send my aunt or my mother to knowing that she's not going to get taken advantage of it too. It's a company that operates with complete integrity and they're actually sought after by all the manufacturers because it's like, if you can get your line in there, they're so particular about what they'll carry, but you know, they'll do a good job with it, but they won't, they don't carry junk. You can't, you can't walk out of audio advice with something that you won't be happy with and won't be proud of. I mean, it's, and that's, that's, they're not paying me to say that. They didn't even buy my beer, Christ. I, you know, but it's it's uh, it's really true that you can. Yeah, thanks for the it's thanks very, for the buzz. Obviously, we really appreciate that. And and Leon, who's normally joining me, he's built an incredible business that we're uh, lucky to sort of stand on his shoulders here. And um, you know, to your point, one of our one of our key differentiators that we're really proud of is is a you know selection of curated products, right? So if we carry it, you can feel confident that we stand behind it because believe me, we won't go into the details, but we say no to more products than we say yes to. So. Now, there are a lot more other brands and products that we could carry that we just simply say, you know, it doesn't meet, you know, our, our threshold to make sure that it's a quality product that we would recommend to our aunt, uncle, you know, niece, nephew, uh, as if they were our own customer, right? So we really appreciate that. And that means a lot, especially from uh, from you guys. Um, Jeff, everybody is, uh, you're the fanboy in terms of your vinyl collection. So people want to know a little bit about your, why don't we go down this path? Tell us about a little bit, maybe about your collection. What is a, a favorite go-to sure. demo track that maybe we'll go around the horn and ask? And then... Uh, you know, I know Buzz mentioned it. Tell us a couple different ways that you can care for your records. And I know you've got some some cleaners and so forth that we can discuss as well. All right. Well, I guess I'll go first. The um, yeah. So that I mean, this is this has been I've been mean, trying to put a room like this together my whole life. That's uh, that's kind of what it comes down to. So I, I was that kid and, you know, I'm coming to middle 40s now. So I'm that guy in the late 80s, early 90s who was still buying records and 
you know, as my favorite bands were still putting out uh, things on on LP, I was picking them up at the record store and, you know, still buying a lot of CDs at the time before streaming. I know for a lot of people that are on this live stream, it's just like, what? Physical media? What are you, crazy? Uh, but uh, somebody in the stream asked, you know, how many records is too many asking for a friend? Um, probably this is too many, if we're being honest about it. But I enjoy the heck out of them. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's just a great, Buzz touched on this before, and I think one of the things that that always attracted me to, to LPs and to playing music on vinyl was it's it's something you're doing deliberate, deliberately. You're taking that time out, and for the next 20 to 25 minutes, what you're doing is listening to the side of a record. Um, and I think that's especially important now that we're spending so much time on streaming, and heck, it's hard to even get through a whole song sometimes if you're just you know, on a streaming service. It's like, yeah, I'm bored. Let's do the next one. Next one. It's a playlist. It's all this random stuff. But there's something really wonderful about listening to properly, you know, good album format music. Um, you know, a lot of these artists that I love, they put a lot of time and energy into making a really good record with a really good sequence from song to song. It tells a story. The songs have to hang together. Um, and even if you don't have a lot of time, it's one of those things that spend that 30 minutes Cue up one side of a record, sit down, enjoy it, take a little break, and it's participatory listening. You're really going to get something back from doing that in a way that I don't find I do when I'm just listening to a Spotify playlist. Uh, that stuff certainly has its place, and I love it for music discovery. Uh, but more often than not, if I hear something I love, I'm picking it up on record. And that's, you know, you do that for enough years and you end up with that behind you. There you go. Uh, Nick, Buzz, anything to add? Uh, Nick, I know you're. We 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 found Nick at a at a record store many many years ago, right? Yeah, yeah. I started collecting records when I was, I was probably in about eighth grade, ninth grade maybe, uh, and then I got a hobby of it. Uh, I lived in a small town, so there really wasn't much to do except for go to antique stores. So I would go to an antique stores and started collecting uh, old country records. Uh, funny enough, and so obviously my Americana influence. I'm super eclectic, uh, but. When it comes down to that, it was a big part of my collection. So started doing that. I found some of my dad's uh, AV equipment in the garage, <laughs> put it all together. And so I worked at a record store getting paid um, half in cash and half in store credit. So I built a pretty quick collection. Uh, you know, 20 bucks for a college student and 20 bucks in records is, is pretty good. So uh, they're, they're great. How many records is too many? I have to move a lot, uh, so <laughs> the uh, those are that's that's too many. That and um, whenever you have to, I, I've seen some people that have to rethink their floor joists, uh, where it, because it, their floor starts to cave in a bit. So that's almost too many, but that just means your house isn't good enough. So you just have to upgrade that, and then you can keep right. going. Uh, there you go, right. uh, Jonathan. You asked about uh, <laughs> favorite demo tracks. Uh, there's you know, there's demo tracks for a lot of different things. So demo tracks for bass response, demo tracks for sound staging. Uh, one of my personal favorites, uh, you know, I'll go back on the, since now I've talked about Americana and old country, uh, I'll, I'll stay along with that. There's a song by uh, Dolly Parton and Chet Atkins playing together. It's called, uh, Do I Ever Cross Your Mind? And it's, it's done live, it's kind of all candid. And for sound staging, it's just absolutely phenomenal. So on an okay set of speakers, it'll just sound like the voices are coming out, uh, you know, all across the board. On a really good set of speakers, you can pinpoint where Dolly Parton is, and you can pinpoint where Chet Atkins is, because it was recorded with a single microphone. So it's just an absolutely phenomenal test track. If you uh, want to check it out, do I ever cross your mind? <laughs> awesome. I'll throw out a, a few more just if people are looking for specific ones. So uh, more modern, I guess we should say, and bass is what reminded me of it when Nick mentioned that. Uh, certainly, uh, you'll hear it a lot of shows, too, is Daft Punk's Random uh, Access mm -hmm. Memory. Uh, that's, that's recorded big, I guess you could say, on kind of a, a more mellow, but an overlooked album, which just sounds really good, is an er early Elton John album called Tumbleweed Connection, uh, which just sounds fabulous. It's just a good, honest recording. Um, on the Americana uh, vein for, for those guys, uh, there's a not so well-known artist, but he does a lot of studio stuff and put out an album recently. His name's Will Kimbrough. Uh, it's called I Like It Down Here. Fabulous sounding, really good music, uh, and a small indie artist, you know, good good guy to go, go buy it. 
buy your music uh, if you can. Do it on Bandcamp or do it on the artist website and support the artist. They're really hurting right now. They can't tour, so they got to rely on that stuff. So you can do your part for for the arts by buying some music right now too. Uh, on the other end, uh, if you can find it, there's it's very rare, but uh, Project has actually released a few albums that are favorites from the CEO's uh, collection, uh, recordings uh, typically from Vienna, from the uh, Vienna Symphony Orchestra in the greatest concert hall in the world. Uh, there's a recording of Beethoven VI, the Pastoral Symphony, which is huh, just, I get mellow thinking about it. So, you know, there's a few of them for you to go, yeah, go, right. go out for. Uh, for those of you who are just getting into vinyl, you know, for me, admittedly, I, I, you know, I've, I'm relatively new to vinyl, just got into it a couple of years ago. I have a project uh, turntable. And for me, one of the things that was it was very different and unique is that, you know, my wife and I will put a uh, an album on and we'll listen to it from start to finish. Right. So unlike, unlike having a bunch of different, you know, saved playlists on, you know, Spotify, Cobas, whatever it may be. We have a couple of different records that we love, you know, late at night, kids are in bed. We're just hanging out on the weekends. You know, we put the record on and we just let it play. You know, we can you know have a glass of wine and talk about you know our day and our week and our dreams and all that kind of stuff. That's what makes it a lot of fun for us. Uh, so, if, you know, if that's something that you're looking for and then you really get a sense of, you know, maybe what the artist had in mind is they built that full album as opposed to just listening to maybe one singular track at a time. So that's sort of my two cents there to add. A uh, couple of good questions um, about the specific components. Maybe we'll dive a little bit deeper into uh, on, on turntables. So someone asking what the benefit is of a cork mat. So maybe as you move up, the, you know, from a felt mat, cork mat, you know, what are your thoughts there? What what are you getting in terms of benefits uh, as you move up from maybe a standard mat that came with the with the turntable? Jeff, we'll start with you. Whew. Well, um, the, I always like to say, you know, this is sort of like when you buy a new pair of shoes, you know, and you've got you're walking around on different sort of different surfaces. You know, you're walking around, you're walking on hardwood, you're walking on concrete, you're walking on, you know, outside, maybe on the grass. There's a certain amount of energy that's going to come back towards your foot based on the shoe that you're wearing and the surface that you're walking on. So the combination of the surface that the record's playing back on, which is the platter, and then the cork material that's actually coupling that record to the platter, it stores and releases energy differently. And this is sort of, you know, Nick alluded to this before. You can get as crazy with this as you want. Um, every single one of these things will have a different acoustic signature. Um, and that's, you know, the, the big one is, you know, I like acrylic platters and a, without a mat because they don't attract pet hair and they don't attract dust. They're simple, especially if you're in a part of the country where you've got forced hot, uh, forced hot air heat, um, you know, the joke that Buzz tells is like, you know, you put a felt mat on a turntable out, you got white cat hair on that thing in like 30 seconds, even if you don't have a cat. It just comes out of the universe and it's like, how do I have cat hair on this? There's not a cat in the house. Um, but that's a real thing. So acrylic platters are great for that. Um, they also have the benefit is they couple with the, the vinyl a little bit better. As you move up, that turntable over my right shoulder, that big RPM 10 carbon, that's one of our flagship pieces. Um, on a lot of those, we actually use a mat made out of a machined vinyl blank that's just completely machined flat. And it's, it's basically, we have an adhesive that ties it to the machined aluminum platter. Um, the best possible transfer of energy or lack thereof is for the same surface. So, you know, it's, you play around with it. But the, uh, the little ones, like uh, the Debbie Record Master, something like this that has a steel platter, um, the felt mat works great. I like the cork mat quite a, quite a lot. Or my favorite is the cork and rubber it. It's a, a one millimeter thick, kind of the best of both worlds. You get, you know, the cork and rubber. It doesn't store too much energy. It's not too high. So it doesn't start throwing the geometry of the stylus off. They work great. There's all kinds of different options. Hey, sorry. I just got to do two shout outs here to... Uh... Uh, the, the, sorry, uh, Michael, who's talking about Pat Metheny's new Chautauqua. Oh, yeah. And Chris Guter as Thomas Dolby, The Flat Earth. If you can find that, that's an amazing sounding album. So, yeah, you guys are, you guys are nailing it here. Awesome. Cool. I love it. Uh, uh, Nick, Chautauqua was that recorded at Chautauqua up in the Chautauqua Institution? Where? You're, you're oh, unfamiliar yeah. with this album. I am. This well. All right. Nick, Nick, your thoughts? I'm glad this is recorded. I want to listen to those albums. I, I had not heard of those. Um, 
You know, it, it depends. So a a cork mat, like uh, like Jeff said, it's got different tonality, and that's that's a big piece because you know some people will scoff at it, being like, "Oh, we're just changing a mat can't change tonality." Well, if you if you think about it, a record each groove you have to have almost an electronic microscope to be able to even just see the the grooves themselves. They're smaller than a grain of sand, so pretty much anything you do is going to change something. Whether we can hear it or not on each piece, it depends on the system. But uh, you know, cork mats, they can help with you know, isolation, static, things like that. Uh, that's the biggest thing that I've noticed. I've picked up some felt mats before, and there's been a, um, a slip mat stuck to the bottom of it. That's kind of a pain. But cork mats, they do help, and they, uh, they look better, in my opinion. I think they look really good, depending on the system, but partially aesthetic, I will say that. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff, maybe you can show us our uh, our second giveaway for best question, the, the swag bag, because yeah. it has a lot of uh, a lot of fun stuff that people may not know about or may want to so, learn more about as well. So one of the things, and hopefully whoever whoever wins this, it's uh, you're getting a little deeper into the sort of the, the analog habit, and you're trying to figure out how do I set up my turntable, how do I get the most out of it. Um, so this is something we put together a couple of years ago. So it's a nice it's a record bag. So when you're out there doing your shopping in the future, and you can go live to your favorite record store. You can bring home all your treasures. Um, but this comes with a couple of cool things for setup and for just kind of daily maintenance. So uh, first thing for setup, and this is, uh, this is an alignment protractor. So this is one of the hardest things when you're setting up a phono cartridge. And one of the things that we love about products like the debut Record Master, we do this at the factory, all right? But when you mount a brand new cartridge, you wanna make sure that it's exactly in the right place there's two little slots that this cartridge can slide back and forth. You wanna make sure it's exactly at the right place so that it minimizes distortion as it traces across the entire record. Um, somebody in the, in the chat had asked at one point, you know, what about, what do you think about straight line or tangential tone arms? Um, in a perfect world, the tone arm would move just from side to side and it would trace one line across the record, but they are almost impossible to do properly. Hugely expensive. All the Japanese companies tried, uh, Rabco tried, Harman Kardon, whatever. Um, the easiest way to do it is with what's called a, a you know, traditional tone arm that we have now, where it's a radial type and it comes and it traces a radius across the surface of the record. That means at two points, the, the groove is going to, the tip of that stylus is going to be right down centered in the groove. So this is a tool that lets you find that correct point for setup. Um, strobe it. It's a cool strobe disc. Um, purpose of this little guy is when you're actually playing back your record, you spin it up, make sure it's going at the correct speed. And this just allows you to check that on speed. If you've got a turntable that has adjustable speed control, this is the tool required to make sure that you're actually running at the correct speed. Um, level it. This is a really nice little basic spirit level. Um, this is one of the most overlooked things when you're setting up a turntable. If you're starting off and the whole thing is at an angle, that means that no matter what you do, one half of the stylus, it's gonna be leaning into one groove wall more than it should. So you always wanna make sure it's balanced out. A lot of our turntables do have the ability to uh, to actually an adjustable foot, uh, but the level it, great way to find out, make sure that it's properly done. Uh, stylus force gauge, this is really important. Making sure, adjusting that counterweight on the back to make sure that the tip of that stylus is pressing down with just the correct amount of force inside the groove. Too much, you can damage the record, damage the stylus. Not enough, oddly, you could also damage the record, damage the stylus, because it just starts banging around wildly inside the groove wall. So it sounds terrible and can damage your record. Um, lastly, there's actually two little basic uh, sort of daily maintenance thing. Clean it, which is a little stylus cleaning brush. Um, right. You'll see people, you know, and this is, you know, my dad, like everybody just, they lick their finger and they go to, you know, get dust off the stylus, please don't ever do that. Yeah, we've got a lot, of people, a lot of people actually have asked that question, how do I clean my stylus? And again, you want to be yeah. careful. I can't tell you how many people uh, reach out to us that basically they don't realize it, but they broke their stylus. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's not yeah. easy, fun or cheap to fix, right? Yeah. And this is uh, this is one of the downsides is, you know, cartridge technology has improved. You know, the materials have gotten a lot better, um, but part of that is they're typically lighter, um, by the time you get into real expensive stuff, the cantilevers are made of materials like boron. It's also relatively brittle. Um, so if you knock into that, it's really easy to just damage it. So yeah, use a good stylus brush. Um, and we also include a carbon fiber, just a little record uh, record sweep brush. So this is great. This isn't gonna get you a deep clean, but if you just have some surface dust, 
some hair, whatever. You just want to get that up, uh, up the surface of the record. That's all included in the best or the second giveaway prize. There you go. So lots of stuff for uh, if you're just getting in, into vinyl. That is uh, again, it's a rabbit hole. You can go deep, deep down, uh, which makes it a lot of fun, right? It's it's yeah. fun, and that makes it a lot of fun to keep upgrading your your table or maybe some of your accessories. Uh, you know what's cool though, Jonathan? Something you said that really resonated with me. You can go down a rabbit hole. You can be crazy, uh, but it's also it can be a really simple system, and you're going to communicate with your music differently. You know, I love that story that you and your wife are sitting there. You're talking about your days, your dreams. I mean, that stuff happens when you take 30 minutes and you're just sitting there together and actually paying attention as opposed to just watching another show on streaming video. You know, yeah. it's like you're just tuned out, looking at the TV. You're not talking to each other. It's like, it's really amazing. What? Uh, thanks for that. Yeah, Brian Becker asks, what do you guys think of a record weight? So what are your thoughts on a record weight or maybe a record uh, puck, if you will? I know a lot of folks look at that. What are your thoughts there? Buzz, you want to take this one? Sure. Um, it's very simple. Uh, generally, avoid record weights unless the turntable was designed for it. And they, the bearings just aren't designed for that extra weight. So there are things called record clamps. Project makes one called a clamp it. We're really imaginative with the name. It's not a shout out to the Beverly Hillbillies for people who remember that, but it's a lightweight aluminum clamp that just helps to bond the record onto the platter. Jeff talked about that a little a bit before. Um, we see a lot of people who put record weights on there and that's great as the manufacturer because it means we'll sell you a new turntable sooner because you're going to ruin the bearing. It's going to you're actually going to increase the rumble and the noise for it. It looks cool, but it's a bad idea. So in general, unless you've got probably a two thousand dollar on up turntable in in broad terms, stick with a lighter weight clamp. And then if you've got a big one, most of the big high end turntables that Project makes actually come with a weight for it. But you know, we it's probably the single biggest mistake that we see people make when they're doing upgrades is putting something on that will actually decrease performance and damage their equipment. Yeah. yeah. Well, somebody asked a question about um, I think they said would, would would a less expensive turntable like a Crosley damage your record. And so I'll, I'll maybe throw that out there to you guys, but obviously something that is very, very important is uh, being able to balance the tone arm. And so if you're getting a brand new tone uh, turntable, that's something that you do want to make sure you, you can set up. And we've got a lot of great videos. And if you buy a turntable from us many times, we will also send you the uh, tips and tricks video on how to balance that tone arm. We make it really, really simple. Uh, but maybe I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on, you know, what, what are some ways that you, what are some things that you can do to avoid damaging your records. And then maybe lastly, before we uh, start to wrap it up here, what are some things that people can do to uh, take care and clean their records? Yeah, I can, I can probably chime in on this. Uh, you know, whenever I got into the, the entry level side, uh, when I was working at the record store, we were selling turntables and uh, this is embarrassing to say, but um, I won't mention the record store. We actually had a penny on uh, the head shell of our, sure. uh, yeah, because you know, we didn't know. We, we had it on our head shell, and so we we're like, hey, it keeps it from skating. Not knowing the technical side of it, it's, it was probably damaging all of our records. And, you know, it was super popular, really probably more in the 80s and 90s of uh, probably 70s and 80s, more than likely. But people putting, uh, you know, the penny on there, that's a that's a huge, huge issue. So, you know, that's a, that's a common mistake, a uh, mistake to happen in the entry level. So you know, going off of that, you know, whenever you're looking for an entry level system, uh, you know, just I do do your research. That's going to be that's the, about the uh, the main piece of advice I can give you. <laughs> Anything else to add? Uh, Jeff, I, yeah, I mean, since the average new record is about 30 bucks, twenty nine dollars or so, uh, it doesn't take very many to exceed the cost of a cheap turntable, which will destroy them. So um, and the cheap ones actually come with a, a cheap needle that's just basically a ball shape it doesn't fit down into the v-shaped groove it's just not not a good idea it's not a not a good investment it's not going to sound good and it's actually going to damage the vinyl which is at the end of the day going to probably caught like jeff's got a lot of expensive gear there and i still bet that his record collection is worth more than the entire sure. system all the hardware put together that, you know that happens all the time so not a good place to to cut corners too um I will make the little plug for project, um, happens to be true, but 
they don't make a bad turntable. I mean, it's we we will not. There's just a certain level that we will go to. We will make a really basic turntable with no features other than an on-off button, but it's going to have a really good quality Ortofon or Samico cartridge on it, a real cartridge, and it's going to have a lightweight, low-mass tone arm. It won't damage your record. The other thing, most importantly, the biggest detriment to both the sound and the longevity of it is dirt dust what cat hairs we were talking about cleaning your record and cleaning the needle will make the needle last longer and it will make the records last longer jeff how do you clean your record there you go yeah well i mean in there's a couple ways i mean when you get to the point where your collection takes over more than you know eight shelves on a little ikea stand you probably want to get a vacuum cleaning system um so kind of back behind me i've got the project vce that's a really cool little accessory you manually apply the cleaning fluid to it, kind of use the brush to get it down there in the grooves. It's going to lift out a lot of that dirt and sort of puts it all in suspension. And then we you know, run it around the vacuum a couple rotations in each direction, pulls all of that dirt and embedded sort of dust and just grit off the surface of the record. Um, there's a lot of different options. Um, that's, uh, but at the very least, make sure you're using a, a decent brush. Um, don't use alcohol. Don't use any alcohol-based cleaners. They're typically really bad um, for the surfacant on the, the, the on the vinyl itself, and for any of the gear that they touch. Um, you know, if you got to use it, you know, real basic. We've seen people doing this for years with a real, real mild uh, detergent with a whole lot of distilled water, and then manually applied and dried. Um, so that's you know the beauty of a product like the VCE. It's five hundred bucks. It's not in, you know not an unsubstantial investment. Uh, but you don't have a drying rack full of records that you can't play because you're waiting to. That's right. Know, waiting for everything to dry question. out in the kitchen. Yeah, it's in super super important. Those things were great. You know, super easy to clean your your records. Maybe you've inherited, you know, someone's collection. Uh, it's a great way to sort of, you know, lack of a better word, dust dust them off, um, give them a good clean, bring them back, and uh, and they'll sound great. Um, well, we are all up against the clock here, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's been a ton of fun. Uh, we'll announce the winner for our best question of the evening. So if my my good friends in the background can put that up from uh, from Ray. Again, I can't pronounce Ray's last no, it? Forgive me. Uh, we'll put that up here in just a minute. But I think one of the reasons why we chose that for the best question is I want people to feel like, hey, there's a lot. You know, we can go down the rabbit hole. Like we said, there's a lot of information. Um, but, you know, come to Audio Advice. We want to make it really simple for you. Don't feel overwhelmed. Uh, don't feel like you, you know, you can't ask us a question that, you know, you might sound like you're sound like you're disqualified. That was the question that he asked. Um, I don't want to sound disqualified. Right. So he asked, you know, kind of an introductory question to vinyl. I think they're looking to put it back up here any second now, but if not Ray, we will reach out to you, the winner of Jeff's amazing vinyl swag bag. But again, uh, you know, it's a lot of fun. We can, we can go down this, you know, for many, many hours. We'll go back and answer as many questions as we can. Uh, they were asked that we weren't able to get to. And again, we appreciate so many questions it makes this a lot of fun. This makes it e makes it very very easy. We could talk about this for for hours, right? Um, it, we're, something we're all very very passionate about. So, congrats to uh, to Ray for our best question, and then I will put back up our uh, our turntable package here that we're going to be giving away, which is uh, really really exciting. There's the picture of the debut record master in walnut, which is an incredibly attractive finish, along with the Audio Engine A5 Plus wireless. Uh, so then you go. Oh, I don't want to give that away just yet. So the uh, $1,100 value of the package plus the audio, audio advice record care bundle, uh, which is really, really cool with the sleeves, the uh, stylus cleaner, the record brush uh, and so forth. So our winner of our live stream for the month of February, let me find it here from Denver, Colorado. We've got Davis Turner. So Davis, congrats. You are our winner. Thanks for being part of the live stream. Thanks for entering our giveaway. Uh, we will reach out to you and make sure that we get everything sent to you here real, real soon. You are absolutely going to love it. And real quick, we uh, will announce our giveaway for next month. So let me pull that up. We will be bringing back our friends from Klitsch, who we are excited to partner with them to give away a brand new speaker that they have brought back for the fourth generation. Uh, it's one of their heritage speakers. It's a brand new Forte 4. So we are really, really excited to give away a pair of Forte 4s, uh, you know, 
several, several thousand dollar giveaway that we're really excited about. We're going to be talking about what went into uh, the Heritage line, what went into the, the Forte 4, what makes it unique and, and different from the Forte 3. That link is live now. So go ahead and sign up, put it on your calendar to make sure you join us next month. Uh, Nick, thanks for joining me this month as my uh, my co-host co -host here from Audio Advice. And Bud, Jeff, thank you guys for joining us uh, from Project. You all guys also represent I'm sorry, represent Sonico as well. So um, we are very, very grateful to have you guys tonight. Thanks again for joining us. And we will see everyone again next time. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Right. See you next time. Cheers. All right. Cheers.